I've got everything on, I've got it on U version, all the blanks. I don't have the verses on, on the note sheet, on the um, overhead, but they are on U version as we go through today. We are going to be talking Romans a little bit. Um, so you can follow along on U version. The verses are in there, and the note, the slides will be up for the blanks. If you have the note sheet there, if you've got a connection card, you can fill it out for us. Um, just some information so that um, if you want, we can contact you or I know there's a spot for prayer requests or um, anything we can do as far as that goes. And that if you have any questions, if you put them down there, I will try and answer them. If I don't have the answer, I will get with Jason and we'll figure it out. But just warning, I may not have the answer today. Um, but we are going to be in Romans today. Um, we're going to be in Romans 15 through 23. Um, before we start, I'm going to say a quick prayer. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that bad? Yeah. Perspective, Josh. <laughs> um, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and to uh, worship you and show you how much we love you and uh, how much we appreciate all the things that uh, you do for us and especially the things we take for granted on a daily basis, Lord. That we know that you supply us with the abundant life here on earth, Lord. And, and, uh, I just pray that we as a church and as individuals, as we go through our week, can, can be the light to other people. And, uh, I pray that you speak um, through me this morning because um, it's you, it's not me, it's, it's not what I've written. It's, um, it's definitely you speaking through me. So just I pray that that goes well, Lord, and just pray that... <laughs> Service goes well. Thank you. Amen. So we're going to be in Romans 6, 15 through 23. And um, the basic truth, Jesus is Lord. This has become the distinguishing mark of Christianity. Um, real quick, if we look in Romans 10, 9, it says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the best news we could ever get. Um, we don't deserve it. Uh, it's a, a gift of grace that we get, um, that God's done for us. And it means we're set free. We're set free from being a slave to sin. We're set free from being a slave to guilt. We're set free from being a slave to our own fleshly desires, um, Honestly, things we know are wrong that we decide to do anyway sometimes. And uh, if we look at the, the, the Greek for the word Lord, uh, the Greek version of that is kuros, I think, K-U-R-I-O, which translated speaks of ownership. Um, well, the Greek for master or Lord is despotos, which is defined as an authority figure that exercises complete jurisdiction or someone who wields unrestricted power. Um, this describes God for us. And if we look at it, this is why Jesus had such disdain for, for those of the Pharisees or uh, believers that pay homage to him with their lips, but not with their lives. In Luke 6.46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? If this is true, are we really free after accepting Christ? We know we're set free from sin and guilt, but are we really free? God paid a price for us, for our eternal souls, and for our life here, so we can have abundant life here. Um, but there was a cost for him, and, and it's a cost so great that you can't even wrap your mind around it, giving up his only son. Um, but we were purchased. If that's the case, are we truly free? And the, what, after looking at a bunch of different things, I wanted to do something in Joshua, and, and I looked over, and I was thinking about maybe David a little bit. I kept coming back to this, and I got a chance to preach it a couple weeks ago in Swan Quarter, and I sure didn't want to do this in front of people I didn't know. Um... It just, I was not comfortable with it, but I did it. Because it, I just felt it's where I needed to be. And for me, it came down to true freedom is slavery to Christ. Um, it's not slavery 
true freedom is not slavery in Christ because in kind of designates we can go along with it. Whereas true to Christ indicates that we're required to do something. That it's not passive. Um, so I looked through the, uh, some of the verses and I saw this word doulos. So I looked it up, and the Greek for doulos is slave. There's not really any other way to translate it but slave. But as the Bible had got rewritten and rewritten and rewritten, it had changed. Some, it had changed to servant, bond servant, because the people that were writing them thought slave was a little harsh. So it changed over the years. The metaphorical means one who gives himself up to another's will. Those whose services are used by Christ in extending and advancing his cause among men. Slave is a favorite self-designation of many of the disciples and other writers of scripture. James, Peter, John all start their letters, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul repeats that, it is, that he is Christ doulos throughout his letters. Romans, 1 Corinthians, Titus, Galatians, Ephesians, and in 2 Timothy all start that way. The term is used over 40 times in the New Testament to refer to believers. The Hebrew equivalent for doulos is used 250 times to refer to believers in the Old Testament. From all this, we can safely conclude that the Lord wants to see believers in this way. So I'm going to talk today about the freedom of slavery. And we're going to look in Romans 15 through 23. And let's see. Good God, that's small print. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as a slaves of obedience, you are slaves to whom, the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that, through, that though you were slaves of sin, you have become obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed, and having been freed from sin. You became slaves of righteousness, I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free to, re to regard to righteousness. Therefore, whatever benefit you were deriving from the things from which you were now ashamed, for the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I got a little story just to illustrate freedom a little bit. My wife and I have a couple of dogs. And we got this big boxer pit, but we, she bought, and I didn't want another dog. We had a dog for 15 years, it passed, I was done, I didn't want to get that attached. And she bought this little, dumb, Pekingese poodle, and she goes, but we can name it Harley. He is the coolest present I ever got in my life. But this dog is so pampered. I mean, he sits on my shoulder, watches TV, um, <laughs> has to run to the house, sleeps in our bed, which not my doing. We were trying to create, train him. After two weeks, my wife couldn't take it anymore, so she put him on the bed. The dog won. So, uh, and when I take him out, I have to take him out on a leash. Because sometimes he's fine. He'll listen to me, and he'll run around the yard, do what he's going to do, and hang out with Roscoe. And sometimes he'll just give me that little look, tilt his head a little sideways, and then he's gone. And I've got to chase him or just let him run. I mean, he just, it's instinctive that he wants to be free. Um, 
And we all long for freedom. We want to enjoy life free from despair. We want significant lives. And moreover, God has created us for freedom. It was and is his intended destiny for us. If that's the case, it leads to what, I, what I've read is the great Christian paradox. Is that we're free from slavery to sin to become slaves to Christ. True freedom is slavery to Christ. In Romans uh, 6.15-23, through 23, Paul shares two critical facts about slavery. The first one is slavery is inevitable. Paul says in Romans 6.15, When shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? May it never be. This is similar to Paul's original question in 6.1. Does grace encourage sin? And Paul's translation was, may it never be. And, and he was very emphatic about how he said it. As I looked at it, I'm like, for me, it'd be like, what, what are you thinking? I mean, you've got the grace of God. Christ died on a cross for us. And we're going to choose to sin anyway? Even though we, in our hearts, know better? In 6.14, we see Paul explain that Christ is broken the bonds of sin that enslave us. He warns us, even though we are free, we can become enslaved to sin by yielding to temptation. We are a new person and, a new, and have a new position. But that's not enough. We've got to cooperate daily with the Holy Spirit and give ourselves a way of slaves to who we are. In 6.16, Paul states that every person is a slave. Do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? The rhetorical question, do you not know, assumes that the principle that everyone is a slave to something or someone, whether it's a person, a possession, an activity, um, we become slaves to whom whom or whatever we present ourselves to. Being neutral is not an option. To choose neutrality is to choose sin because it shows a refusal to serve God. We are either slaves of obedience or slaves of sin. 6.16 basically tells us there's only two masters, sin and obedience. This means that there are two types of slaves, and only two. Slaves in sin resulting in death, and slaves of obedience resulting in righteousness. There is no third option. Look at me. Excuse me. Paul is saying, I have good news and bad news. The bad news is we're still slaves. None of us are free. We are all in bondage to what controls our lives. Someone says, I can't can't say no to food is a slave to food. Someone who can't turn off the TV or social media or spend time with family or spend time in his word is a slave to those things. Someone who can't break an addiction to pornography is a slave to immorality. We are all slaves to what controls our lives. That's the bad news. Here's the good news, and Paul talks about it. As believers, we get to choose our master. An unbeliever has no choice of masters. He is a slave to his old self. And as hard as he may try to break free, the change of sin keep yanking him back. But as Christians, we've been liberated to serve a new master. We can opt for obedience resulting in righteousness. Matthew in 6.24, and we've probably all heard this, No one can serve two masters, for he either will hate one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. And in Romans 6, 17 through 18, we are reminded that we have been emancipated from slavery to sin. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which was, you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Now notice Paul doesn't say that that form of teaching to which was committed to you but he says 
that form of teaching to which you were committed. When you place your faith in Christ, God instantaneously sets you free from sin's power and commits you to a new slavery. The Greek translation literally means handed over. As Christians, we are handed over by God to a new realm of power to serve as slaves of righteousness. In John 15, 15 and 16, No longer do I call you slaves, for slaves do not know what their master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, I chose you, and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit, and that your fruit would remain. So whatever you ask in the Father, in my name, he may give you. It comes back to true freedom is slavery to Christ. It is dedicating your life and your whole life to him. Uh, and I fall short on that constantly. I hold on to so many things, whether it's control of my money or control of my attitude. Um, I'm a little type A, so not having control or trying to give up control is, is something I still struggle with a little bit. Um, the second thing Paul was talking about in these verses is that slavery is intentional. Oops, I've got to catch up. No one becomes a slave or functions for Christ through osmosis. To be Christ's slave requires intentional effort. Just as the great command, go and make disciples, was not, as a, re not a request. It requires intentionality. Um, to be a disciple is to be taught. And it, when he taught all the disciples, he sent them out. And he, as apostles, they went out and preached the, the good news of Christ. But it was intentional. They had to do it. It just didn't happen. In 619, we hear Paul say, I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as I presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness. I don't think that was my phone. Resulting in sanctification. Paul contrasts our former way of life with our present. Our former was like, remember the old Lay's potato chips ad? You know, you can't have just one, and they, they would eat the whole bag. Sometimes the sin, even the little sins in our life can be like that. You know, happens once, you know, like, well, that's no big deal, I'll ask for forgiveness or whatever. Um, and then you do it again and again. And, and it definitely... You know, one lie leads to a second and leads to a third and so on. Our present way of life is to present ourselves as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. Paul gives us this command, present yourselves. And in this context, present simply means intentionally put yourselves at God's disposal for use in his kingdom. Sanctification here is an ongoing process of being set apart for God. It is simply progressive Holiness. A Christian evangelist, Louis Palau, had a quote. It says, if you like sin, you're going to love holiness. And that's what Paul is telling us through those verses. In 620 to 21, he says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you deriving from the things from which you now are ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. He concludes in this passage that by, argue, argue, by arguing that following God results in holiness and eternal life. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and outcome eternal life. Again, he compares the new to the old. As a result of being freed from sin and enslaved to God, we derive benefit. We benefit our spouses. We benefit our children. We benefit our bosses uh, with our behavior at work, whether we like our boss or don't like our boss. If, if we're truly following God's command and doing the best we can with what he gifts he's given us, 
It will benefit your boss. It will benefit your co-workers. Um, and it benefits God's church, whether it's this church or another church, but it benefits furthering the kingdom of God, which is our great commission. Go, go and make disciples. But the biggest benefit is to us. Because slavery to God frees us to fulfill the destiny for which He created us. Paul explains in this thought in the final verse, in 6.23, For the wages of sin are death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. We often use this text for unbelievers, which is well and good, and the principle is true without question, and it surely applies. Um, it, it just, it's the great news. It's the great news that we accept what God did for us, accept the price that He paid for us, that we're free from sin and have eternal life. I think we miss sometimes that um, we kind of focus on, okay, we're free from sin and guilt, and now we have eternal life but there's a space in the middle. And He promises us that, that will be an abundant life if we allow Him to. But Paul here is applying this principle to the saint, not to sinners. He's speaking to believers, not unbelievers. This was said for Christians who may be toying with sin, not the unbeliever living in sin. Fortunately, God offers us eternal life. In this context, eternal life is the resurrection life experience that Paul develops throughout 6, 1 through 23. Um, if you break it down, if we know it's verses 6, 3, and 6, 9, if we consider the cost, it's 6, 11, if we present ourselves, it's 6, 13, and if we obey, it's 6, 15. And we will experience the benefits of eternal life in time and in eternity. Now, there's a story in 1 Peter. A couple of verses I want to read. 1 Peter 2, 13-17. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king or as one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers or the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. I got a story, and it just, it's somebody you all know. I'm pretty sure you all know who it is. And it started in about 356 B.C. And um, it was a young man, 14, 15 years old. He was Roman, born in Britain. And he lived in the lap of luxury. His, his grandfather had money. His dad had money. They had a huge estate. Life was great. He was 14, 15 years old. And some Irish pirates kidnapped him. And ins took him to Ireland and enslaved him for... 10 years. And um, his dad happened to be a, a priest. And he had believed, but 14, 15, did he really believe? Well, throughout the years of being enslaved, he truly accepted his faith in Christ and dove into being a Christian. And he had a dream one night that he would have a way to escape. And it was shortly after that he got he, he snuck onto a pirate ship and got back to Britain. He got back to, 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 to home. He was accepted back in the family. Everything was great. Um, he was so moved by the vision and by, by his new faith, he became a priest. And he felt so obligated to Christ, to be a slave for Christ, that he went back to Ireland, to the people that had enslaved him for eight years, 
and was the biggest movement through Ireland to this day, as far as religion goes. Um, I will tell you who that is in a little bit. Um, so we know true freedom is slavery to Christ. How can we help focus ourselves on that? And I think I've come up with four things to help us with that. The first thing, we recognize who you are in Christ. We no longer are a slave to sin. The reason we are still sin is because we choose to serve the old master rather than the new one. Yet sin has no authority over our lives anymore. Focus on your identity in Christ. We are a new creation. The second step, welcome Christian slavery. And this one's pretty simple. The choice is not, should I remain, retain my freedom or give it up to submit to God? But should I serve sin or should I serve God? And we talked about that a little bit. If we truly accept Christ as our Lord and personal Savior, um, we have to dedicate our lives to Christ. And, it, and that, there's some intentionality with that. The third um, thing we can, pro can do, don't give up on our battle with sin. You know, if you, if you slip up, it's easy to say, well, I've already committed the sin. I might as well give in to it. Or, you know, I've made some mistakes today. I, I don't want to pick up my Bible and read. I don't want to think about God. I just want to put all that on hold. And, and you know, you stop pursuing God. You put Him on the back burner. You, you, I'll do it next week, or I'll go to church on Sunday. You just you, you give up on the commitment to pursue God. And that's not what God wants. God wants us to pursue Him in the midst of our sin. Um, confess your sins to the Lord and keep short accounts. And just keep pressing on to spiritual maturity. There's an old Chinese proverb, you don't, fall, you don't drown by falling down in water. You drown by not getting up. Just don't give up. Don't give up on sin. And the fourth one, it, it, this is something I struggle with. Believe what God has promised. And, and for me, it goes back to the control thing. Whether it's money or, or is work busy enough and, and I start stressing about that or whatever. God's got me. He'll handle my provisions. And I can't get myself always to stay relaxed and be faithful in that knowledge. You know, it always runs back, well, I, you know, I've got to make this much, or I've got to do this, and what am I going to do if that doesn't work out? And I don't, I, I look at the disciples and say, how could they not believe what they saw, what they were present for? And they had doubts. And he was denied three times. And, and they were there for the miracles. And I do the same thing now. I, I, there's just times I don't trust them, and I don't understand why. Um, but we need to believe what God's promised us. He doesn't want to deprive us of any good thing. He wants to bless us and give us every good and perfect gift. We've got to trust Him. This is what the Lord does in our lives. He takes what we give Him and gives all of Himself to us. He always has His glory and our best in mind. One question, can we give more? I know I can. I know I don't give Him everything. And everything is the good and the bad. You know, a lot of times we don't want to verbalize what's, what we may have done or what sin we have, holding on, whether it was anger or resentment or a conversation we didn't have, we should have had. Um, we kind of hold that back or don't ask for forgiveness or don't, Talk to God about it a little bit. He already knows. Now, he, he's the one that tells us to tell him and to ask for forgiveness and then move on. Um, keep short accounts. So since slavery is inevitable, 
We need to choose the right master. And since slavery is an intentional, we need to rely upon God's strength to present ourselves to Him. True freedom is slavery to Christ. Now, does anybody know who the person was? No. Yes, St. Patrick. So he was neither Irish nor a saint, yet he's St. Patrick. So I thought that was a little interesting. Um, if you've got any questions, if you want to write them down, I will try and answer them. I make no promises. Um, I don't have a whole lot more, so I'm going to close this in prayer, and the band can come back up. We're going to be out here early today. <laughs>